Inequality, sexism, and misogyny. An embarrassment for Tokyo ranking dead last for gender equality among G7 countries. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Japan's gender gap. In just a few months' time, Tokyo is set to host the Olympic Games. But what was supposed to be a time of anticipation and celebration has been marred, not just by the pandemic, but also by sexism. Several key members of the Tokyo Olympic Organizing Committee have been forced to resign in recent months for making sexist remarks, including Japan's former Prime Minister, Yoshiro Mori. During a meeting leaked to the media, Mori was quoted as saying, women talk too much when discussing the committee's plans to increase female representation. His remarks, though, are not uncommon in Japan, and they reflect a much wider problem. Despite gender equality being enshrined in the Constitution, somehow the country still ranks 120th in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. And it's easy to see why. Just under 10% of lawmakers are women. The global average is closer to 25 and when it comes to equal pay, the situation is even worse. The average Japanese woman's income is a staggering 43.7% lower than a man's. Now, the government says it's working to improve gender equality and had pledged to have 30% of senior management roles filled by women by 2020. Sadly, that's proved too difficult a task, so that goal has been pushed back an entire decade. So why is Japan's gender gap so great? and what can be done to close it? To help us answer those questions, I'm joined from Tokyo by Risa Kamio. She is a member of the Setagaya City Council in the Japanese capital. Nancy Snow is a professor of public diplomacy at Kyoto University. And Ichiro Fujisaki is former deputy foreign minister and also served as the Japanese ambassador to the United States, the UN, and the WTO. Thanks all so much for joining us. Let's begin here then uh, from the roots that uh, weren't mentioned in my brief introduction, most people who know Japan can attest to a rather unique division of the sexes, I'll say it that way. I, I even heard one person actually call it voluntary gender apartheid. Risa Kamio, why, as a developed and highly educated wealthy democracy, does Japan have this level of gender inequality? Um. I, I lived overseas for 12 years after graduating from college, and I grew up in Japan. And I came back, uh, I, I lived in the uh, United States, uh, Poland, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And when I came back to Japan, my son was uh, three years old. And I faced the difficulty of raising a child in Japan as a working mother. And I questioned myself, why? This is my country. and people are smart and people can make changes and why the situation is like this. And that was one of the reasons why I went into the politics uh, field. And now I think uh, there are three problems and three ways to uh, change. And uh, one of them is the policies. So as a city council member in Setagaya, Tokyo, uh, we had about 500 uh, waiting lists for the nursing school. And uh, last year, it, uh, it went zero for the first time in history. So I think uh, we are making changes. Uh, we are making uh, solutions. But uh, right now, it's, uh, the quantity is getting there. But uh, it's the time for us to change the quality. So that's one of the uh, solutions for me. And um, another thing, an another okay. thing is, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'd actually like uh, to go back first uh, before we talk okay. about the changes and the progress uh, that has been made. There has been, been some. I'm trying to help our audience understand why this exists, these problems exist in the first place. Nancy, let me ask you, what's uh, the cultural and historical context for gender inequality in Japan? You know, I've got an outsider's perspective coming from the United States, but having lived in Japan and having taught at the university for the last six years or so, 
And I think for so long, Japan became a real success story with this division of labor, with the salary man stereotype. I can still recall that uh, when I was in college and graduate school. And so the the woman in Japan had a lot of power in the home, and she was the primary caregiver, and it worked very effectively. In fact, women also controlled the purse. And I think, too, for many women in Japan, there was not an interest in politics. That was a public space that was dominated by men, and women had the had the private sphere, the home. So, of course, with the new century and with these so-called lost years or the lost decade, there has been uh, this effort, and then we saw it most recently with Abe, with womenomics, to really put gender equality as a mainstay of helping Japan develop its economy now. And I think there's a great deal of awareness of this internationally and also domestically, but what we haven't done is really gotten an idea of all the stakeholders involved. You can't just do women's conferences and have the super women speak and expect that you're going to have change overnight. It takes a lot of political will. It also takes someone like the council member who lived abroad and came back and saw a, an opportunity to make a difference at the local level. She's a role model then for not only other women and men. So as I said, I think it worked for a long time. And so it's mm -hmm. hard to give up. And mm -hmm. so much of the uh, impression, even talking about gender gap, comes across, it puts people sort of on the defensive. You, you have to be pro-women's equality. But we have to look at it more in terms of a landscape of how are we going to give people more life choices, men and women, and how are we redefining the family? How are we redefining the workplace? Right. These conversations are taking place now during this COVID era. And that's, that's positive. But Ichiro uh, Fujisaki, I need you to tell me from a male uh, Japanese perspective, can you explain the mindset are, are Japanese men and women generally not quite comfortable mixing with each other equally on both a social level and at work? I think that was the case, uh, but it's changing rapidly as well. And as uh, Dr. Snow has put it very <coughs> correctly, um, I think uh, uh, until about 20 years ago, uh, Japan's uh, model was a success story and uh, that was based on competition between companies, competition between individuals. And all men were just competing, competing, and didn't think anything other than sort of winning the race with others. And then there was a last decade or two decades. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, in the last 10 years, we are starting to really look into this matter because now our rate in the... Uh, by uh, Davos w uh, World Economic Forum is 120 in the world, and that's not where we should be. So there's a uh, mind uh, changing occurring in Japan, uh, especially since uh, Abe, as uh, Dr. Snow said, but uh, this came a little too late. That's the situation. Right. Uh, there have been some embarrassments, obviously, for Japan, not just in those ratings that you mentioned, but what we mentioned about, uh, you know, Yoshiro Mori for example. And, you know, soon after he resigned, uh, the ruling party in government said it uh, was willing to allow women to attend its, its all-male board meetings, but that they should not be allowed to speak. Are they serious? I mean, do they really believe women talk too much? How ingrained is that stereotype in the minds uh, of Japanese men? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, oh, I see. Uh, no, that was said by Mr. Mori. It's not said by the ruling party. It was the, Mr. Mori's uh, statement. He said, hey, uh, some women talks too long, doesn't understand this, sort of uh, read the situation. Right, but and later speak the government long. party <clears throat> had said that they would allow women to attend board meetings if, if they didn't speak. Uh, I, I don't know that. Okay. I don't think that's correct. 
uh, I, I think uh, maybe someone is misquoted there. Okay. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, I think the real problem is not only women, to tell you the truth. The Japanese way of uh, having board, member, board or conferences, in many cases, already the conclusion is there. And it's, some people say kabuki. Some people would be asked and say yes, and the others would say that's a great idea, and it's all set up things. So even if it's a man, if he doesn't catch that and go and speak his view, uh, he would be he or she would be seen as sort of outsider. That's the real problem. And also, uh, what he said, uh, uh, Mr. Morris said, is out of tune uh, from of the world trend as well as Japanese trend now. But uh, very frankly, the ruling party didn't notice that uh, and uh, wanted to uh, go along with uh, Mr. Mori as long as. Uh, Okay. Uh, but but then the world opinion and Japanese opinion didn't allow that. Okay. Uh, Risa, let me ask you if you agree. I mean, you had once said that uh, what Yoshida Mori did was like a game of whack-a-mole. He just happened to be the one that popped up, then got hit. But there are many moles. Um, do you think there is, there is a broader problem? It's a, I mean, it's, it wasn't so much a misunderstanding that these, some of these male counterparts of your own uh, do feel that there's a stereotypical woman that takes up time, talks too much, and sometimes her, she doesn't add value uh, to what they think they're trying to do. Uh, as much as I think it's a uh, men's uh, mindset that has to change, I also think it's women's uh, mindset needs to change. And when I said moles, uh, I didn't say all oh, the moles are men. I think it's part of it. Part of it is uh, women. And as a woman who, uh, who is uh, working every day, I think we are missing a role model. And uh, to be successful as a woman, uh, we had to. Women had to become like men uh, in the past ages. And I think. We as a women have to be more natural and uh, do our part in the business and in the society so that uh, men and women can uh, collaborate and uh, take part in uh, changing the society. And Japan. Risa, you also interested- Kamiyo san you are the role model. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Risa, you also said something interesting though before about raising a son. And, and I think you're part of the equation on how women have to change. You said, uh, it was strange for you to have to get used to telling your son to do some housework, to do some chores. That's not how you were raised. So it's an entire mindset of women's and mothers that also has to adapt. Have, have you made progress yourself pers in your personal life? Yeah, I've been trying every day. <laughs> like recently, my son is uh, right now seven years old. And I started asking him to fold his clothes and it makes me feel guilty as a mother. Like I feel guilty not folding my husband's clothes, my son's clothes as a woman and as a mother. And in Japan, I think we have this mindset that women have to do all, women have to do most of the housework, otherwise we are failing. Mm. And I think that mentality has to change but uh, our life is so busy, our everyday life where we have to clean up, cook, make a lunchbox for kids and take them for after school activities. And women do more, many things for raising children and uh, for husbands. So I think we need to reset our minds and try to do the housework with husbands. I right. Think. Children. It's, it's a pretty dramatic change that Japan is looking for. And I mean, Nancy Snow, I also have to ask you about this because in 2005, uh, Shinzo Abe and his conservative party had warned that treating women equally in the workplace would threaten family values and, and Japanese culture. But then when he became prime minister, he looked to champion women entering the workforce. Tell me, was that to improve on gender inequality 
or was it to actually just improve the economy because Japan needs to capitalize on their female workforce? Well, I think that part of the criticism of Abenomics or Womenomics that came along with it was that it was this overemphasis on let's take advantage of women in the workplace. And there was enormous pressure put on women that not only should you go back to work, uh, but also you should get married and raise children. It had a lot to do with uh, uh, handling the demographics the low birth rate. So women were expected to do it all. And, um, you know, there's also this perfectionistic uh, ideal of a Japanese woman. We, we see this in the literature. We, we hear it from Japanese women themselves, even this idea of feeling guilty, of, you know, that they have to take care of everything at home. But that's where the power base was for women. So, I'm fine if Abe wanted to put the emphasis on the economy, but we've got to get broader now, as I said earlier about a landscape. This is post Abe era. We really have to think hard as we're all doing in these new times of what kind of a future do we wanna to create together? I'm seeing a lot of young Japanese women going abroad. I mean, the, mm. the statistics really favor a lot more younger women going abroad and in part, perhaps they're going through this liberating experience, but they need to come back and contribute then. And even Nobuo Tanaka at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, my, my friend there has talked about in his travels, and I'm sure it's the same with the ambassador, meeting these exceptional Japanese women in leadership roles in international organizations overseas and his worry that there is this brain drain, if you will, it's kind of an old term, but that these women don't have the desire to return to Japan because they don't see that spectrum of opportunities. And that's what needs to be changed, okay. but it can't just come from the top down. Uh, Ichiro Fujisaki, there's another issue here. Yes. I mean, some women uh, deliberately choose not to work because in Japan, the work culture is very physically taxing. Working hours are very long, days off are very limited. Uh, physically, it takes a toll that some argue men are actually just better equipped for. So does the entire uh, can, work can I, culture... Can I answer? Go ahead. Uh, you see, uh, uh, when I married my wife, uh, she was 22 years old, senior at university. And uh, uh, she became a, a housewife and mother. Uh, but my daughters, uh, they uh, graduate after they graduated from college. She's, they started working. They have kids, and they're working still. So it's totally changing now. Japanese women uh, who are working is over seventy percent, which is more than United States. However, the problem is that no, not too many CEOs. I th as you say, or uh, parliamentary members. And the reason is it takes time to uh, train these managers. And uh, uh, it was uh, 10 years ago, 2%, 3%. Now it's 12%. Uh, it did, hasn't reached 30%. But 30% was a little too ambitious. Everyone knew it. Now it, we are coming along. The pro two problems we have to really uh, prepare is that, uh, as Kamio Risa said, kindergarten and those uh, working environment. The second thing is we have to hire a little more cheap laborers, foreign laborers, like in Europe or United States. We don't have that. We are all Japanese, same wages. And that's one of the reasons that and there's not too many uh, babysitters, teenage. So women has difficulty and men. So we have to change men's thinking as well as women's thinking right. and companies thinking. But, I was asking uh, whole, about something whole society. Slightly, slightly more specific, though, about work and corporate culture. And if that needs to yeah. be reevaluated entirely uh, so that maybe working hours are shortened, maybe there isn't this culture of, you know, seven days a week and then also having the responsibility of going out after work uh, with certain male colleagues and engage in a social culture that's also connected to the corporate life. Um, if that is changed, yeah, the, right, would, would that take 
too high a toll on the economy, arguably? No, no, no. no. It's quickly changing. In the big companies and government, as you say, it used to that they would go out to drink or mahjong or karaoke every night and uh, try to enjoy with the colleagues or entertain their counterparts. That's quickly changing. They go home. So it's better for women to wanna... uh, participate Sorry. as well. Go ahead, Risa. Yeah, I also want to add that 80% of men want to take uh, parental leave, but only 6% can take it, is taking it. So I think that needs to change. And if men wants to take it, take it. You know, we need to change the mentality at the company and organization too, so that uh, women can get support from husbands. Right. Nancy, I can see you agree right. there. Nancy, but there's also another there. issue at play in Japan, and that Japan is trying to manage a declining birth rate. So they are in trying to encourage women to have children. Are they ready to adapt? I mean, how much longer, I should ask, will it take? They want to adapt from what we're hearing. But how much longer will it take before they can actually learn how to help women balance a work and family life? I think if you had more of that balance, you would probably create conditions where people would feel more secure uh, getting married and having children. But for many women I know who have really reached the echelon of organizations here in Tokyo, many Japanese women I'm referring to, they have put off marriage or not married at all. And this is a huge difference between my first time in Japan in 93 and 94, where women who were unmarried by 25 years old, they had this sort of Christmas cake parable that they were no longer marriageable after that age. It was uh, something shared with me that was a big surprise. And it's antiquated, of course. But now, again, people are making their own choices. They're making more individual choices. I think there's opportunity now in, uh, in the COVID era that you can redefine not only self, but also your approach to work. And there are people who have lost the traditional path who are now choosing to think outside the box and become more entrepreneurial, maybe think about settling outside the big cities and starting over again. And again, that's that's men and women as well. So I, I don't always look at it as, uh, as a negative, this gender gap. It, it's the, the problem will actually help to produce more options. Maybe not more children, but that's where the immigration comes in, the need for more foreign labor, which Japan is changing about that too. Okay. Uh, Risa, quickly, just one point. I mean, we've also heard uh, the option of forcing gender quotas uh, in, in the workplace in Japan, uh, corporate and otherwise. Uh, do you think that would work? Or are there just not enough resources to uh, allow women to work the hours that they would need to to participate uh, the way that they should? Uh, I, I question myself about it. I, I, I don't know the answer. I, I would like to ask the other two panelists uh, what they think. <laughs> but uh, I think, as uh, Nancy said, that uh, we need to have our own choice. And I think we, we are good at telling, uh, being told what to do. <laughs> and we need to change education as well. But uh, we are raised to to cooperate with others. And we are raised to do what, whatever we are told to do. So sometimes it's good, like uh, for COVID and others. And But uh, I think it's time for us to choose our lives. And that's, that's the first step for us to change our society. OK. You know what? I'm, I'm going to have to end it there. Uh, Ichiro Fujisaki, I'm so sorry I couldn't give you a final word, but we are Completely out of time uh, for this panel and this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd really like to thank all three of you just, so much. Just one word. I'm cautiously optimistic. That's good to hear. That's good to thank hear. You. I know there's a lot of work to be done, and now 2030 <laughs> is the deadline, so hopefully uh, it can be done in the next nine years or so. Thank you, all three of you, so much uh, for being with us on the Newsmakers from Tokyo. I'm Andrea Sankey. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.